Okay, hi uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Wendy Wong, and today I want to share with you my little experiment on uh, applying AutoML with biological data sets to predict clinical outcomes. So uh, automatic machine learning, um, which is uh, also known as AutoML, um, has a lot of definitions. So um, according to Wikipedia, um, AutoML is the process of automating the process of applying machine learning to your world problems. And um, um, this, this basically means that um, AutoML should be able to take a raw data set and uh, come up with the um, optimum deployable machine learning model. And uh, as a computational biologist, um, I have seen the explosion of uh, biological data in the past 10 years. And uh, biology has really become a information science. So uh, according to this paper that was published in 2015 called Big Data Astronomical or Genomical, <clears throat> it's predicted that in 2025, even though the acquisition of genomic data is still going to be less than astronomy data, the uh, the storage of genomic data is going to be two, two to 40 times higher than astronomy data. And there's actually, we are not lacking statistical methods for analyzing all sorts of biological data. Um, so there are almost 700 statistical methods written in R um, hosted on uh, Bioconductor, which is a um, open source software platform. Um, so I decided to uh, carry out a little experiment to uh, learn more about these uh, AutoML algorithms um, to see whether um, we can use AutoML to, um, to uh, quickly gain insights um, without uh, knowing much about the data set itself and uh, whether um, certain uh, feature selection can be used to help uh, uh, to optimize better um, algorithms using AutoML, and finally, whether explainable AI can help us gain insight um, so using very generic uh, explainable AI tools. So, um, so before I start, I want to um, just talk about a little bit about a uh, biologic. What's different? What's different in uh, biological data sets compared with? Um, the, the um, AutoML, which is supposed to be general, but mostly um, uh, used for um, for optimizing data sets that are from uh, large companies. So um, one huge difference is that um, biological data sets usually have a lot more features than number of data points. It's very difficult to collect samples, uh, especially human samples. And it's even more difficult to collect cases um, compared to control. So that often leads to um, a very unbalanced positive negative samples. Um, here I'm showing the uh, central dogma, which um, we take the, uh, the genomic DNA gets transcribed into um, RNA and then RNA uh, gets translated into protein. So for a typical RNA expression uh, data set, we are looking at the uh, 30,000 non-redundant human mRNA sequences. So these are, uh, we are measuring the abundance of these um, mRNAs and of which 20,000 are protein encoding. So um, I decided to look at a, a data set on uh, studying preterm birth on uh, gene expression. So this is a data from uh, Hang et al. Um, so they look at the gene expression from pregnant women at two time points. So uh, preterm birth is uh, when the baby was born before 37 weeks. And this accounts for one in 10 births in the US. And uh, the cause of preterm birth is largely unknown. Um, but the, um, but the, the, the health outcome is pretty severe. Um, the babies sometimes need to stay in the hospital for uh, over six months. And um, so, uh, so they, they use a very simple multiple logistic regression with stepwise selection. Um, and they didn't have a test set. So um, they reported the five-fold cross-validation AUC to be uh, equal to 0.703 uh, for the gene expression data alone at time point one. So um, I set up my uh, my study as follows. So I'm going to study, 
I'm going to look at three AutoML libraries, the H2O AutoML on AutoGluon, which is based on MXNet, and Teapot, which is based on um, Scikit-Learn. And I want to set the time limit to only 20 minutes for these algorithms to optimize. Um, and I'm using MLflow uh, developed at uh, Databricks for keeping track of the parameters and results. And then I'm uh, also going to look at the uh, whether um, feature selection can help. So I'm using the fast correlation based filter feature selection, which uh, looks for features that have high correlation with the target, but little correlation with each other. And I was also going to look at the top difference uh, differentiated genes between preterm and footer, uh, but I ran out of time, so I didn't do that part. So um, briefly, um, the data, I have the raw data, and then um, I would feed all features or the FCBF selected features um, to uh, the, four, uh, the four algorithms, including the H2O GLM as my base model. Um, so I tried to do as little pre-processing as possible. Um, so I downloaded the normalized data from gene expression Omebus um, at NIH. And then um, I'm only going to look at time point one for this experiment. Um, so uh, this accounts for uh, close to 30,000 genes with only 165 samples. Um, and about one third of them are preterm. And then I split it into training and test set uh, seven to three ratio. And I quickly did a principal component analysis to, to see whether there's outliers that I need to fold out or there, whether there's obvious batch effects. And there doesn't seem to be any, um, the colors represent the preterm and the full term mothers. So um, this is an example code for uh, running uh, my uh, little experiment uh, using H2O auto ML in R, um, the uh, Teapot and also auto Gruon are Python APIs, so, uh, but the setup is pretty similar. Um, so um, I set the experiment name with um, MLflow as H2O auto ML because I started um, the using um, uh, H2O to, uh, for my experiment. And I'm actually using the same name for uh, Teapot and uh, AutoGruon, so they are uh, tracked in the same experiment. Um, so uh, for each run, um, I run the algorithm and I keep track of the parameters. So here uh, for H2O AutoML, um, it's basically one line of code. I, I give it the features that uh, as X and the target as Y, and then um, the, the data frame name. And then uh, since my data is unbalanced, so I um, set balanced classes equal to true. So when uh, H2O does cross validation, it will uh, uh, automatically um, oversample my cases so that the case control are balanced. And then I also uh, set the number of votes for cross validation in this case is five. Um, and I run this and then I, I lock all the parameters that I use. So um, the algorithm is actual auto ML and uh, the uh, votes for cross validation. And then, oops, one second. Um, and then I also keep track of the, um, the uh, top model metrics. So here um, I'm keeping track of the um, training AUC and um, training um, precision recall AUC. So, um, and also I track the uh, top model. And then um, I also keep track of the performance um, on the test set. And lastly, I save the model as, and save the H2O, the, the the top model in, uh, from actual auto ML, and then I lock the artifact. Uh, I did the similar things with uh, Teapot and auto Um So, and then I can open up the uh, MLflow UI to, for, um, to look at all the, like, the runs that I have performed. And I, as you can see, some of my runs have failed. Um, so this is a nice way to look at everything I've done. And I can see that uh, for H2O Auto ML, my uh, top model is X3 Boost for um, this 
to run without uh, any feature selection. And uh, it, it gave me the best, uh, the top model is a uh, ensemble model for, for um, with uh, feature selection. And then uh, with that, I can uh, select these um, models and then click compare. And then I get this nice table with all the parameters um, and metrics that I have tracked. And the first thing I notice is that there's very severe um, overfitting going on um, because the uh, training metrics is so much better than the uh, test um, metrics. Um, Another thing that I notice is that I probably make a mistake for uh, H2O uh, that the this is our uh, running time in seconds is much greater than the 20 minutes that I set up. Um, and I also and for teapot it uh, but for H2O auto ml it at it finished within five minutes uh, with, with feature selection, but teapot didn't finish. Uh, within 20 minutes, even with feature selection, but luckily it does give me the best model um, uh, within those 20 minutes. So, um, Wendy, so this is your five minute warning. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, this is so we can see that a, with feature selection, uh, Teapot does, does improve because I think most mostly because it was able to uh, do the uh, to go through all the models uh, more efficiently. So I don't want to draw very strong conclusions based on an incomplete uh, uh, experiment, but um, I have the feeling that AutoML probably does pretty well when there are a few factors with large effects on the outcome. But in a biological system, it's, <clears throat> it's basically a lot of factors that contribute to the clinical outcome and each one has small effect. And this, um, um, it, um, it, I am not sure how uh, AutoML um, uh, deal with this and whether it could um, optimize efficiently to the best model. And I, I think that feature selection does help to at least reduce the time for finding the optimum model. And uh, to also, it should also help in reducing overfitting, although we still see overfitting in the um, in, in my little experiment. And I also think that AutoML is very useful and it's convenient, but maybe we need to have some things uh, add to um, more, some domain specific features to be added to the AutoML. So like feature selection, um, that based on prior knowledge of biology, like the pathway. So Kipa has that um, feature built in, so I'm going to test that later. And also custom metrics. So for example, if we are more interested in the sensitivity of picking up preterm mothers, we need to optimize that. And uh, expra explainable AI, I, I, I haven't spent too much time on that, but from what I can see, it was, um, it was mostly interested in giving out individual feature importance, but in biology, we are more interested in looking for um, interaction between the features or um, whether a pathway gets um, um, changed with a certain phenotype. So that's not, um, that we probably need to go to more specialized software for that. And lastly, the stability of the auto ML algorithms, because we have this, uh, small sample problem. So I'm not sure whether if I change my input a little bit or I change my random seed, do I get a completely different um, model? So that need to be investigated as well. So um, so I just quickly show you the package I use. So uh, this is um, when I listen to other data science talks, this is my favorite part to, to see what tools they have used and so that I can try them out. So these are the ones I use. So I just want to point out that Mark P is the one I use for generating these slides. And Mermaid was, um, I use Mermaid to um, produce the flow chart that you see earlier. And lastly, I just want to point out that I have keep track of the auto ML libraries on my GitHub. So please feel free to check it out or uh, contribute to it. And I'd like to thank all the organizers for organizing such an amazing event. And thank you for your attention. Wendy, thank you very much. Um, thank you, that was a fantastic talk and you were exactly on time. 
<laughs> okay. so slightly quicker than you expected. Um, so I just wanted to point out to everybody that there's a ask a question button on the right hand side, um, or it's fine if you just want to put the question in the chat. Do we have any questions? Because we've got certainly time for one question, maybe even two questions. And if we don't have time for any questions, then please, everybody, have a think. Um, and you can add your questions to this session even um, when it's finished. Um, and Wendy, you will be available to uh, ask any questions if people have any follow up in Slack, won't you? Yeah, I will be checking Slack. So thank Great. you. Okay, Bye. thank you very much. That Bye. was fantastic.